about conflict resolution. And I've, I've also, even when my editor uh, was looking at the editor that's working through this now, that you're getting all the edited, professionally edited stuff now. And he said, where does this fit in exactly? Because you don't really talk about prodigal conflict. So we added a little something this week to make sure that we framed it. And let me frame it for you. And that is that that it could be conflict in your prodigal situation, but, but prodigal situations, as Jim said, causes conflict in general. It causes conflicts in the marriage. It causes conflict in the family. It causes, when you're upset, it causes conflict at work. I mean, and, and, and spoiler alert, but even if you don't have a prodigal, conflict's a problem in life. And, and learning how to deal with it is amazing. So when I came to Watermark, uh, it used to be like a uh, I mean, we, I think it was it was several weeks in the uh, newcomers, and uh, one of the uh, one of my friends who was an elder here led that community group, and he said something that struck me, and he said, "I always keep this conflict. I think you have the field guide here. It was something else before, but that field guide that you have now, he says, I have a copy everywhere I go, at at work and home, at my briefcase and whatever." And I thought. Wow, I mean, what is this thing? I, I need to know what this thing is. And now I have a copy on my computer and at home and work, and I, I do the same thing. And so as I was getting into Watermark and I learned about all this conflict resolution and community and in open and short accounts, uh, we had a friend in our community group that uh, they had a, their marriage had a serious issue, and the, the husband had, had really committed some serious issues in the past. And, and um, uh, he, he owned it, and we dealt with it, and, and time went on, and time went on, and it was a, a year or so after the thing. And, and the point was that there was just never could be, it didn't seem to be, in, in our opinion, it seemed like there was nothing that he could do to get out and, and from under, under the, the wrath of the spouse. And it was a complex situation. I hadn't lived in it, but, I, but we felt like we needed to go and try to resolve this conflict because it was causing a strain in the community group in between. These were our, some of our, our best friends. And uh, so we went to a restaurant. We call it Laduni Night. So we went to Laduni, and, and uh, uh, we closed that place down. And honestly, at the, we, we addressed the issues because this was the watermark way, and it was the biblical way, and it was Matthew 18. And we, we, we did it, and we asked the hard questions, and we dealt with the conflict, just like we're going to talk about tonight. And two and a half hours later, if I could have walked home and just shot them the finger, I think I would have probably done that, okay? I'm just, I hate to tell you that, but it was just, did not end well, right? And we had gone to the, we had gone to the end of that rope. We had, uh, we, we were, we, we were, came in the same car, so we had to drive home together. And when we, when we, when we drove home, we dropped each other off and the niceties were said and, uh, but we'd work through this conflict. And I'm going to leave it there for a moment, and then we're going to go through conflict, and I'll tell you how that in ended up. So what's your initial reaction to conflict? And uh, is it withdrawal? Is it changing the relationship? Um, is, it, is it anger? Uh, is it attack? Um, uh, sadness? Uh, all these things could happen. Gossip? I'm going to go talk about the friends and justify my actions? Is it dismissal or justification? And, and, and all those things, the issue for those kind of reaction is pride. It's honestly, it's pride. When we have, we have conflict, uh, pride is what gets us uh, uh, as, as the issue. And so let's go back and look and see what the, what the Bible would say as opposed to, you know, we've been hurt and we're going to talk about why our pride gets in the way. But, but just look about, if you withdraw or you change relationship, Hebrews would say, let us, let us keep meeting together and let's encourage one another uh, in, the, in the days that we have remaining. And if it's anger or attack, uh, remember it talks about, you know, anger does not bring about the righteousness of God. So anger should not be our issue. If it's sadness, what have we got to be sad about? We're a child of the king. He died for us. We've talked about that the last several weeks, and we're going to keep talking about that every week. And so why should you be sad? That's, if someone's upset with you here, we're both humans. Satan's got involved in this. And if we can fall back on our identity, there's no reason to be sad. Should we gossip? No. Ephesians 4.29, let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but only what is useful for teaching correct. I mean, only, only what is used for building others up according to their needs. And then in dismissal or justification, uh, that can't be the answer because that, that verse says, you know, he who uh, 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 confesses and renounces them finds mercy, but he who conceals his sin does not prosper. So um, there's a worldly response to conflict. There's a biblical response to conflict. And all those things 
are hard because our pride's been injured. And so in John 13, 34 through 35, it says, a new command I give you, love one another. It says in this verse, all men will know you're my disciples by how you love one another. So in the church, it's very important that we understand uh, forgiveness, reconciliation, conflict resolution. And it's so important here um, when we're talking about, uh, um, so we're going to include this as one of our messages in, uh, uh, in Prodigal. And you uh, talk about this in, in your open group in one of your weeks as well. So... Um, some of the highlights is when you're dealing with conflict and you're trying to go through and you're having a conflict, that one of the first things to check your motives. It's fantastic and prodigal because we're trying to remind you that in, in the newcomers group, you'll have a, a personal mission statement. And so remember your purpose in this. In this. And so your motive, it, it, the, the main thing in this is if your purpose is to glorify God, most of us walk, walk into a conflict in order to justify ourselves, in order to get revenge, in order to prove ourselves right. And if you go into conflict that way, it's not going to end well as a believer. If you could actually wake up and prayerfully, uh, don't you hate prayer sometimes? You get up in the morning, and you pray, and you go, ah, this is not what I should be doing. I am so off kilter. So prayerfully talking about those, prayerfully talking to God about how you would approach that. If you, if you read these verses, making every effort to live at peace with men and to be holy, to see to it that no bitter roots grow up and cause trouble or defile, that's God talking you through the Holy Word. If he says, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Don't take revenge, my friend. Leave room for God's wrath. Remember, the only way those people are going to see you at work today or your family is going to see you at dinner is to be someone that loves your neighbor. That's how they're going to know you're my disciple. That's how you lead your family well. So check your motives. Try to remember that your motive is for reconciliation. How great is it when two people who are really at odds and hate each other uh, resolve their issue and reconcile? And so what is the source of conflict? I think that this, if you didn't, I think this would be really helpful if you had to remember one thing tonight. There's several things to remember, but if you, but if you had to remember one thing tonight, it would be what causes fights and quarrels among you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and you covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask God, you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? And I would ask you if uh, the next time you get angry, the next time you have conflict, the next time you're, you're this is a very sobering, brave question to ask yourself. I'm mad at somebody. We've got to have a conflict. We go, what is it that I want that I'm not getting? There is an answer to that question in every conflict. What is it that I want that I'm not getting? Is it respect, money, job opportunity, relationship, whatever? There is something that you're not getting. And then as you process that thing, is that an idol? Is that something I need? Is that something that will bring God glory if I get that? If I win that, is God pleased with me? I mean, those are the kind of things that are really hard to argue with scripturally, but hard to ask yourself because it's, you know, you know the answer's coming. And so um, are those things that we want idols and it's greed, envy, revenge? Is it our children? Is it, is it are we at, mad at our prodigal? Because I was mad at my, my prodigal before the things that he gave up, the the Olympic hopes and dreams, the college education, the, you know, I wanted him to have that, but I wanted me to have a son that had that. I wanted, you know, I mean, there were all kinds of things caught up in those questions about why I was mad and what was I not getting? I was not getting this dream of, of this relationship. And I still don't have that. Um, but if he, but if God, the point of the, the curriculum is, is if you got him, that's enough, right? You know, that's enough. You know, if I'm not happy because I don't have that relationship, I was angry about it, I needed to do conflict, but the fact is I needed to know that God loved me. My respect, my self-esteem, all these things uh, can be idols. So I love this quote. It made me think, uh, 
uh, and unoffendable. You're going to hear a lot more about that because as we come through the verses on anger and forgiveness, I think, I, I, you know me, I'm going, I'm going, there's a lot of truth, biblical truth, not Rand Hansen truth, but biblical truth that Hansen points out. But he says, you know, this jumped out at me. The more possessions we have and the more value we place on them and the tighter we hold on to them, the more we'll be offended if someone or something tries to take them from us. This will lead to predictable and repeated conflict. Don't mess with my idols. And I, and I, and I, I would take that and add a Burns paragraph on that. And it's, the, more, the more I find that, that it convicted me, the more busy I am, the more tight my schedule is. I mean, I'm, I'm creating every opportunity I can to have conflict. Because if someone gets in my way, I've got an agenda, and I'm busy, and I, I got to get there. And it's, but you don't understand. It's for good things. I'm going to the church, and, and you don't get it. And well, the point is, is that you got to create margin. You can't hold on to too many idols. If you do all that, you're just setting yourself up for, um, for conflict. So one of the things I love, there's a guy uh, named Ray Steadman, died a few years ago, and, and, and he, he says in a book um, uh, I wrote, he read talking about our peace, he says, we want to start by clearing up the results of conflict. In other words, our relationships are broken. Let's clean this up. Uh, my family's not happy that I'm not talking to my brother. We got to get this squared up. The point is, we want to start by cleaning up the results of conflict, but God never starts there. Stedman says he starts with a person. He says, peace is a person with a capital P. And in order for you to live at peace with someone else, then you must be at peace with the person of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, the uh, excuse me, the the verse that goes along with that is Ephesians two fourteen through sixteen. He is our peace, who made the two one, and he's destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was, was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. And so the point is, is if we can start with our conflict resolution, with our mission statement is to glorify God, and our peace that we want to achieve, our reconciliation, if we can start with focusing on Jesus, that he is our peace, that he's given us all we need, that he loves us, so we don't need to go gain anything, revenge, or, or being right in that conflict. Um, when Christ makes peace, it's satisfying, permanent, and genuine. I'm not saying there's not consequences to a conflict, and I'm not saying that you have to be say you're wrong all the time. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying own your part, know what your part is in that conflict, and, and go for reconciliation. It doesn't mean to compromise on values and right and truth. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the goal is reconciliation, not winning. And if we know Jesus, then we win. He loves us. He's enough. He's all we need. And we tend to be less offendable. Hansen in his book says, if you, if, if you got a telephone call right now and you had won the lottery and you, or, and you, had, or you had won something or a, an old uncle died that you didn't know but left you $10 million and someone cuts you off in traffic on the way home, it's probably going to be less of an issue tonight. You, you know, you're, you're not going to be that offendable, right? So the point is, if you, if your eternity's secure, in the beginning, God created, stop there, he created you. You're grateful for that. You sinned, but yet he came and did something else, and he died for you on the cross. So you have eternity forever. You have peace right now. He's active in your life. He, you have full access to him at the throne of God. He answers your prayers. If you really believe that, you're less offendable. You're less likely to get into conflict. So every opportunity, one of the things that that, that elder said when he was talking about conflict, the first thing he said is something I've never forgotten. And if I and I always try to remember this when I head into this. Jenny always says, and I've, I say this a lot, she says, you, you know, you just love conflict. I hate conflict. And I go, you know, I say, babe, I don't like conflict at all, but I am reminded that conflict is a great opportunity to glorify God. When things are going great, everybody's happy. But if you can persevere through these difficult times of conflict, it is a tremendous opportunity 
Don't miss that opportunity. Glorify God uh, to trust him, obey him, to serve others, to bear their burdens by just what I got through saying. Just because you go there to reconcile doesn't mean that you, you don't gently and compassionately sharpen the other person. It will help them. It will, you can bear their burdens. You can confront them and understand why they may be, uh, um, have a problem, but you can serve others by also speaking truth to them in love through conflict, uh, telling them you want to reconcile. You can become more like Christ. You can confess your own sin. You can, um, uh, um, and you can turn from attitudes that promote conflicts. So the biblical conflict resolution, you'll probably talk about this quite a bit tonight, so I'm just going to, to uh, fast track this a little bit. But in big, biblical conflict resolution, um, the crux of the talk is to is to uh, the first thing you do is go talk face to face, and um, you know it's it's, it's interesting because I've done this. I did this one time at my work, and uh, I went in. I just you know conflict resolution 101. I went in. I closed the door to a partner, and I and I closed in. And I said, Hey, look, we I've got an issue here. And we need to deal with it. And so uh, the next thing I know, he's saying he's he's being intimidated in the workplace. So you got to be a little careful about this. Not everybody has read the com- field conflict guide. So so you've got to. I, I, next time I, I was making sure that I explained this a little bit more of what I was trying to do, and and what I was trying to do is go and talk face to face. And I think the emailing and texting is my worst issue because I can I can craft a. A, a, an email that if the that if the elders read it, I could justify it. But if they if they but also there's a little bit of barb in there. I'm pretty good about that 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 knife in the in the side on an email or texting, and um, uh, and wording it in just a way where I might be able to weasel out of it. But the point is is that it's just it's so as you know everybody in this room knows that it's so dangerous to email and text, especially in something incredibly emotional. So. I have to learn this. I'm, I'm actually saying this to myself more than anybody in the room is pick up the phone, have a meeting, talk, fa- talk face-to-face, set it up, and, and, and go do that. And if that doesn't happen, then you widen the circle and you bring in one or two other people that, and not just, not just a posse that's going to pile on. I think that happened, and we were talking about this in leaders meeting. It's not somebody that just piles on to the, and, 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 and jumps on your side. I think that when you widen the circle, you get the other person's opinion. Would these people be reasonable for both of us to bring into the circle? And you agree to that uh, on, the, on, the next, on the next phase of that. And then if that doesn't happen, then you widen the circle and you bring in uh, leadership, the church. It may, there may be three widenings of the circle. I don't know what it looks like. When you get to the final thing, it sounds kind of harsh that that you'd bring in the church, and then, you, and then if they still refuse, you treat them as non-believers. And I've been here for 14 or 15 years. It's probably happened that I know about three or four times. And it, 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 there's, here at Watermark, there's a, we, we, we call it a care and correction letter that we send out and say, hey, you know, we've been running you. And most of the time, I don't know all the details of it, but I was in community and worked in community every week for four or five years. So I, I know a little bit about it, and I know that when those things are sent out, when people... Are, are saying, hey, look, there's a way that, that seems right to you, and we've met with you face-to-face, we've widened the circle, we've been walking through this, we've, been, we've gotten into your community, and we've been running. It's usually two or three years. There's a way that seems right to you, but we don't think that's going to work out, but we don't have any more resources to keep walking down this path, and you continue to be in your sin. So those things are very, very, very much outliers. I don't want you to think you rush to this final piece. But it's biblical. It's not. This is not a watermark thing. This is a. This is a uh, biblical thing. It's Matthew 18. This is a Jesus thing, right? And so you you widen the circle, and you treat them as non-believers, and which seems very hard until you realize that how would you treat your neighbor that's a non-believer? You take them a casserole, you love them, and you call them to repentance. I mean, you you tell them about Jesus, and you model it for them, and it's not a not a mean thing. And so I think that's what's what's really, really important. And so, so uh, that, that's, the, that's the, 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 the crux of that, of that slide. And so how do you approach and deal with conflict is I would just say this, is that, that when we first uh, met with our community group, um, I think we took a trip. And I remember the very, very woman who is one of my dearest friends on earth right now. But at that point, she says, don't you think it's awesome? We just get along great. We don't have any conflict at all. And now we've, we've struggled in our community group with the most serious issues you could discuss. Um, uh, we, 
if you don't have conflict in your life, let that be a red flag, that, that you're looking the other way. Having peace at all cost is not, does not bring God glory. It doesn't sharpen the other person. It doesn't sharpen you. It doesn't put trust in God that he can work through the conflict. It's just not biblical. It's not healthy, and it's not real life. If, you know, iron sharpens iron, right? Well, when iron sharpens iron, it makes them better. That is something we say all the time. Let's get together as men, and iron sharpens iron. Check me if I'm wrong, but when iron sharpens iron, there's, there's, there's sparks and there's heat, and it's, it's, it's not fun all the time. And um, so I would just tell you that my deepest relationships are defined with people who I've gone through that conflict with. And that group, that, that couple I was telling you about is that I went home that night, and we, they, they dropped us off in front of our house, and I walked up, and I, I looked at Jenny, and I said, babe. If that's conflict resolution, I'm out on it. I'm not doing that again. That's crazy. We just lost our best friends, right? I mean, what's, what's up with that? And um, so we slept on it, and at 9 o'clock the next morning, with a fresh sleep, they called, um, can we get together? And we got back together with a fresh sleep like that, and we had set on that, and we, you know what we did is we persevered. You're going to talk about that tonight. What happens when it doesn't work? You persevere. We got in there, and we worked for about three hours on that, and we walked through it, and we were able to tell them the reason I said this was this, and we just continued to work through that, and they began to see that what we were doing was loving. I began to see the hurt that she had had in their relationship and why it was hard for her to let go, but yet she began to see that at some point she has to let that go. And, and the point is we worked through all of that, and that was, a, that was actually a really rift in our relationship. We were really good friends, but the fact that I saw how they were interacting was the elephant in the room, and it limited a deep interpersonal reaction because I resented personally that fact. They were, what were they taking from me? They were taking me the peace that comes from just being relaxed, I guess, with them. And I felt like, I mean, I'm going back to that James verse, right? I haven't thought about it until just then, but I think that's what was happening. And so we worked through that. And that, even that day, that afternoon, it was sincere, it was heartfelt, and our relationship took a step up. And I believe their relationship got better because we had pointed out some issues that they began to work through. And our relationship got better because we talked about the elephant that was in the room. And we didn't go back after it was over and say, you know, gossip about them or whatever. It was truly resolved. And I did learn through at that point in 24 hours later that this conflict resolution works. So when I was with the community group, uh, team, and I would go out and help. It's what Jim does, and Amy's doing now, and they work with community, and they go out with those groups. I, I talk to them, and they say, this is just too hard, and this, that, and the other, and I go, man, you are, I'm so excited for you guys. And they always go, what? And I go, you were right there. If you could get through this conflict, and you can take it, and you can just really dig down and get through this conflict, you will not believe how your community group will take off. This is just, I mean, every group's going to face it, so you can either run away from it and never deal with it or deal with it in the next community group, or you can just come in and let's deal with the conflict and go forward. So it's a, it's a hard thing to do, but conflict is a very important thing, and I think that's why we need to talk about it tonight. So uh, let's go to our groups of newcomers who are going to meet that back table. I think Jim might have said that. I think we have quite a few newcomers that are going to meet the back table on the, uh, back there, and then uh, you'll go to your closed group tonight. Lord, I thank you for uh, this message on conflict. I think that I thank you that once again, there's nothing that we made up, but it's all there in Matthew 18 and, and, uh, and in the scriptures that we talked about tonight and many more about how um, you'll know us by our love. So, Lord, I pray that we would, uh, uh, these are difficult things to, to talk about because, we, because we're battling with our pride. I pray that there'll be open, honest discussion in closed group tonight, and then uh, we'll love on the newcomers and welcome them here. And we're, we're so sorry they're here, but we're so glad they're here and not at home uh, floundering, and so we pray that we would have that you we would we would be able to point out an answer to them tonight that that they'd be able to feel the hope that is in you, and so uh, uh, we give you the glory. We're grateful. We thank you that you created us. We thank you that you redeemed us. We thank you we're a child of of yours. Uh, there's no other place we'd rather be. In Christ's name, we pray. Amen.